Hi everyone, I'm Anya Parampil and this is Red Lines. My guest today is investigative journalist and author Gareth Porter. His latest piece in the gray zone is titled Afghanistan Collapse Reveals Beltway Media's Loyalty to Permanent War State. He writes, quote, The media offensive against Biden's Afghan withdrawal advanced arguments that the military could not make on its own, at least not in public. It also provided the military with important cover at the moment when it was at its most vulnerable for its disastrous handling of the entire war. Gareth, welcome back to Red Line. Hey, hi, Anya. Very nice to be back again. The first piece you take a look at in your article is a New York Times report put out by David Sanger and Helena Cooper. Their their article was titled, Taliban Sweep in Afghanistan Follows Years of U.S. Miscalculations and puts forward the idea that Afghanistan could once again, under the Taliban's control, become a safe haven for al-Qaeda. What issue did you take with their analysis? Well, that that sort of uh, a ploy, of course, was, I think, the dominant single argument that was made uh, within the uh, elite press corps, the, the corporate press, against uh, the uh, Biden policy of, of withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, for, for all time. Uh, and it, it is extremely dishonest because, first of all, the the uh, uh, Al Qaeda uh, does not pose a threat of uh, terrorism in in Afghanistan. Never has since the Taliban uh, were really became a powerful movement uh, in response to the U.S. occupation back in the early 2000s. Um, the the, the Al Qaeda presence in uh, Afghanistan, of course, originally was pretty large. It was thousands of, of troops, um, but but uh, over the years, the Taliban have, I think, it's pretty clear, uh, you know, put made it clear to to Al Qaeda's uh, uh, leadership that they have to trim this down. They can't have that many people in Afghanistan. And uh, Al Qaeda actually lost enormous um, numbers of uh, from its original strength, and it's down, as I point out in my article, uh, in in recent times, down to as few as 200 throughout the entire country, um, which and and that's spread out over a number of of uh, uh, provinces. So so that means that they're really uh, just a handful, practically, of Al Qaeda. Uh, agents or or operatives uh, in various provinces of of Afghanistan, they simply do not pose uh, any kind of a threat uh, to do much of anything. Now, there was a time uh, some years ago when there was a an effort by uh, the the IS uh, Khorasan people uh, to to mount a uh, some sort of a uh, uh, an attack on the West from Afghanistan, but this was uh, this was scotched, and uh, you know it, it's uh, Islamic State, Khorasan uh, is is the real uh, threat that uh, the Taliban have had to take seriously in recent years because they had gotten much larger uh, during the uh, uh, during the time the Taliban were fighting the Americans, um, and. Uh, Actually, the, the Taliban uh, made war against uh, the Islamic State, um, Khorasan, uh, in in the around tw- 2018. And guess what? The U.S. military was backing them up. They were providing airstrikes coordinated with the Taliban. So the Taliban has actually worked with the United States uh, on uh, counterterrorism, in this case, of course, against uh, Islamic State Khorasan. Uh, but but that's um, that's very different from the the uh, problem that was uh, claimed by uh, by uh, New York Times uh, in their very uh, very dishonest attack on on the Biden withdrawal. And I'll ask you more about ISIS K in a moment. But I wanted to stay on your analysis of the media. 
you highlight the role former Undersecretary of Defense Michelle Flournoy paid in providing cover, essentially, for the failures of the Pentagon. She told the Washington Post, quote, in retrospect, the United States and its allies got it really wrong from the very beginning. The bar was set based on our democratic ideals, not on what was sustainable or workable in the Afghan, in an Afghan context. What is misleading here about her comments? This is a very amusing uh, sort of note uh, in the entire uh, sort of panoply of attacks on uh, the the withdrawal policy by the corporate media. This was uh, in a an article by Greg Jaffe, who's the Washington Post uh, national security correspondent, uh, and and Jaffe took a different tack from the rest of the uh, the elite media. Uh, in, instead of uh, talking about how there's a danger of uh, you know, United States falling victim to terrorism if if Biden's uh, uh, policy of getting out were to stand. Uh, he he basically interviewed Flournoy and encouraged her to address uh, the problem of how the uh, war the, uh, in the long term, the, the 20-year war in Afghanistan was mishandled and to give some explanation. So basically, he was uh, inviting her uh, to provide uh, a, a response to what was really the major uh, danger to politically to the uh, military leadership in the Pentagon, because they're very vulnerable to anger uh, coming uh, to a great extent from veterans and even active duty officers who are looking back on the war in Afghanistan and saying, hey, we were taken. Uh, th this was an awful war, and and the people who uh, carried it out need to be held accountable. Um, and so, so Jaffe was giving Flournoy an opportunity to try to provide a rationale that would at least soften this uh, this threat, if you will, to the political interests of the military and the Pentagon. And so, what Flo Flournoy presented, which you know, I kind of jocularly, not in my article, but I would call it perhaps Portnoy's, excuse me, Flournoy's complaint. <laughs> um, what, what she did was to suggest that the problem with the management of the war was not so much that, uh, that the, the generals lied to the American people about, uh, you know, victory is in sight and we're doing very well, just hold on, keep supporting us. But that from the very beginning, uh, the U.S. government, uh, including, of course, the military leadership, were beguiled by the idea that we should uh, we should try to enable Afghanistan to realize democratic ideals. So so we were we were overly concerned with with trying to enhance democracy or to advance democracy in Afghanistan. And, and weren't sufficiently aware that the conditions uh, that reigned within the Afghan government would not allow us to do that. And she specifically made the point uh, in, her, uh, in, in her rant, if you will, that uh, the, the United States, that, that the U.S. government, uh, the, uh, the government which she represented as a leader in the Pentagon, as the one who was primarily responsible for Afghanistan policy in the Pentagon uh, uh, were, were uh, mistaken primarily because they wanted democratic ideals to, to uh, predominate. In fact, we know perfectly well, she claimed that they only realized their mistake after they'd, make, after they'd made their bet uh, that, uh, that they could prevail uh, in 2009, 2010. Well, we know, in fact, that they knew perfectly well from the beginning that the U.S. military was relying heavily on uh, allies who were warlords, who had uh, basically militias to offer them, ready mm -hmm. bodies that they could uh, rely on at the very beginning of their occupation uh, to help them to uh, track down uh, and capture and uh, imprison the the Taliban that that were remaining in the country. 
Um, and uh, so, so these warlords were the primary uh, prop, if you will, of the U.S. war policy from the very beginning, from the time of the Bonn uh, Agreement, the Bonn uh, sort of constitutional setup that she blames because it was too democratic. It was too devoted to democratic ideals. The real problem was that it was based on the premise that we could ally on the warlords and depend on them to get us through the difficult uh, pr uh, problem, the, the, the challenge of being able to beat down the, uh, the Taliban who remained in, in Afghanistan. And of course, the warlords were uh, the worst possible uh, people that the United States could ally with in Afghanistan. They were, uh, they were cold-blooded killers. They had no compunction about mass slaughter. Um, and uh, they they uh, abused their power constantly, and they enabled their troops, who became the local police in various parts of Afghanistan, uh, to rob, pillage, and rape at will without any accountability because they were the police. Mm -hmm. and, and so that became a problem that uh, the U.S. government was stuck with and didn't seem to care about, despite the fact that it was clearly going to provide a ready source of political support for the Taliban um, from the farmers and, and ordinary people, in uh, particularly in the Pashtun areas of, of, of Afghanistan, who were the victims of, of these uh, brigands, essentially, under the uh, the authority of of the warlords. This was the fundamental problem, and uh, it's simply not credible that Flournoy was unaware of this. Uh, and and I cite an article uh, that Reuters published in July of 2009 that uh, reported how the uh, the the militias of the warlords had returned behind the occupying U.S. troops in Helmand Province. And um, as, as soon as the, uh, the, the Americans came in, the warlords began their pillage and rape, uh, including rape of women, uh, girls, and preteen boys of uh, the families uh, that lived in, in, their, uh, in the areas that they controlled, they took control of. And those families, uh, the, the heads of the households, complained bitterly to the U.S. and to the U.K., which was also uh, occupying the territory, without any uh, without any response, they never got any response. Never got any help from the U.S. Uh, to stop these warlords' depredations. In that same article, Flournoy says that the U.S. government knew years ago also that these warlords were corrupt and they weren't a viable partner and yet she then went on and was as you mentioned an architect of that surge so that just on its own i think said a lot about her leadership on this issue and she's also someone who went on after leaving government to found the center for a new american security or cnas an arms industry funded think tank based here in washington dc what role has this organization played in drumming up support for the war in Afghanistan within U.S. media? Well, I, you're, first of all, you're absolutely right that Flournoy represents uh, sort of a new type of figure in U.S. national security policy, where uh, she, she not only has played uh, a role uh, as policymaker in fostering and protecting uh, carrying out and protecting politically uh, U.S. wars, but uh, also has played the role of fostering new institutions that are explicitly meant, as as you correctly, I think, point out with regard to CNAS, explicitly intended uh, uh, to protect the, to advance the interests of the U.S. military and the arms contractors. I mean, they're funded very handsomely by both the U.S. Uh, government, the Pentagon, and the contractors, that's the, that, that's the main source of support that they have. And so, uh, so she's been involved in this business of 
sort of whooping it up for uh, the national security state from the time that she emerged uh, into uh, some degree of power in Washington. And, and so she represents this new type of figure who are uh, so totally committed not only to their own personal uh, uh, interests and, and to advance their career, but to advertising on behalf of uh, the, the permanent war state uh, as a matter of uh, so making money in, a, in another way. Um, and, and so she's a particularly odious figure, uh, I must say, in the recent history of, of the permanent war state. And, and she has indeed, uh, you know, as, as the uh, co-founder of CNAS, uh, created a way of, uh, of defending uh, all of America's wars in the Middle East uh, and elsewhere, or, or potential wars. Uh, they're constantly writing pieces that are, uh, you know, protecting the interests and advancing the interests of the military services and the Pentagon, um, and and presenting this as though it were somehow free of self-interest, uh, at least not calling attention to their own self-interest. So, I mean, th this is this is a particularly odious uh, form uh, form of uh, a a. Uh, prominent figure in the national security state of uh, making money in different ways and trying to keep her her uh, uh, her name uh, out there for future administrations. Of course, the fact that she was so pro-war uh, in terms of Afghanistan probably cost her the uh, uh, the position of secretary of uh, of uh, the uh, of the military secretary of of uh, uh, the Pentagon. Uh, and uh, that's because Biden was not going to hire somebody for secretary who was so pro-war on Afghanistan. And David Sanger, one of the reporters we discussed at the beginning of this interview, who wrote the article for The New York Times, essentially criticizing the Biden administration on its withdrawal under false premises, is actually a fellow at CNAS. So that just goes to show you the level of influence someone like Flournoy has developed through this vehicle. Another way to look at it, Anya, is that there is this symbiotic relationship between uh, the, the uh, policymaking elite in the Pentagon and the military, the, uh, the, the contractor and uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the institutions that represent the interests of the contractors and the Pentagon, such as CNAS, and the media, because uh, it's not just Sanger right now, who is a fellow there at CNAS, but they, they've had a constant flow of, of uh, prominent Washington-based uh, journalists who are, uh, who've, who've made it clear that they are uh, strongly uh, going to be in favor of the military and the Pentagon's interests, and therefore are chosen as somebody to bring into CNAS for six months or a year or something like that. This has been a standard practice now for a number of years. A dominant narrative in the media surrounding the war in Afghanistan has been that Biden ignored his military and intelligence advisors, particularly Joint Chiefs of Staff General Mike Milley. Chaos was inevitable because of the fact that we did not work earlier to get a lot of our Afghan uh, allies and partners out, that we didn't work to get our own people out with the Taliban closing in so quickly on Kabul and a lot of uh, pressure now on the administration to say, you had so many weeks to prepare. Why did you not implement this sooner and make sure people were safe and out of country? You heard him say that, uh, you know, nobody told him that the military actually would have preferred to keep a small force there when, of course, there have been multiple reports saying that the top military brass suggested just that. So I think that the problem for the president, among other things, is he does seem to be making assertions that are not uh, in keeping with, uh, uh, with what journalists are reporting and what we're hearing from, from government officials here and abroad. Yes, this is this is a particularly uh, uh, interesting uh, example of how the media is playing its role uh, to the hilt uh, by uh, criticizing Biden on the grounds that he refused the uh, position to to accept the position of the Joint Chiefs, particularly the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, 
uh, General Milley to maintain a force of 3,500 to 4,000 troops indefinitely in Afghanistan, supposedly for uh, counterterrorism. And uh, so, so the, the media critics have really had a field day over this because from their point of view, uh, you know, when, when the Joint Chiefs uh, and, and the military leadership speak uh, to the president and advise him that for American security, it's necessary to have a certain number of troops, uh, and then it, the president says no and goes ahead, this is a signal that the president is uh, ignoring the, the sound advice of his military advisors. Well, of course, uh, you know, the, the reality is that those military advisors uh, have their own institutional interest to defend and to advance. And uh, they have put off for as long as possible the end of the Afghanistan war, in part because it means uh, that, that they are going to face some kind of demand for accountability because they know that there's a lot of real dissatisfaction out there in the public about uh, a war which uh, the public was told over the years was, was being won and which in fact uh, was, was in terrible shape uh, and, and was being lost. It was lost all along. Uh, and so, so the reality was that, that, the, uh, that the military uh, was, was saying this to advance their own interest it had nothing to do with the real national security interest of the United States. But the, the uh, elite uh, journalists who, uh, who are in the van uh, in attacking Biden for the withdrawal naturally are uh, going to be defending the position of the Joint Chiefs. This is an automatic trope of the corporate media in these sort of key moments of turning points uh, when a war begins, when there's a key turning point in the war, uh, or, or, or when the war ends. Uh, and, and this, of course, is uh, perhaps the single biggest turning point that the press corps has faced with regard to a crisis in the permanent war state uh, because of the particular, the peculiar uh, history of this war in Afghanistan. So they automatically uh, defended the, the, uh, the position of, of the Joint Chiefs and attacked Biden. Gareth, as someone who's written about this war for years, I'm wondering your general take on Biden's decision to withdraw. Why do you believe he is so committed to this? I think a lot of people who consider Biden, rightfully so, someone who's backed war policy, someone who's backed fervent imperialist policy in the past, they might be surprised that he's gone in this direction. Well, I can understand why people might be surprised because, indeed, uh, Biden, in the long record that he has compiled as a political figure, both uh, in the Senate um, and and since, um, has has taken many positions which were hawkish, to say the least. I mean, you know, he was, of course, one of the major defenders of the uh, war in Iraq. Um, and and he is something to live down in that regard for sure. Um, but on Afghanistan, he did play a very interesting role. Now, uh, back in 2009, 2010, when the um, the Obama administration was uh, in the process of making a decision about uh, a proposed massive increase in U.S. troop strength in Afghanistan, what they called the surge, the Obama surge. Uh, Biden was was somebody who was very firmly aligned with Obama against going along with what the military was demanding. Uh, he was backing a very different position at that point, uh, saying that we should have a relatively small, a much smaller counterterrorism presence in Afghanistan. He was not for getting out yet. But he was opposing the military's demand for 35,000 to 40,000 additional troops. And, and he really had some nasty scenes with, uh, the, with uh, Robert Gates, the then Secretary of Defense, and uh, the Joint Chiefs uh, in their meetings at the White House. 
uh, which which Gates uh, uh, talks about in his memoirs, and uh, you know has very harsh words for for Biden. So uh, so Biden did in fact play a role that was at least uh, more or less on the right side of that of that decision making process in two thousand nine. And it was interesting hearing him talk recently during an address to the press. He actually cited a Brown University study which looked at the cost of the war on terror, pointing out that it's wasted some $4.9 trillion. Also mentioned the fact that his own son, Bo, died. After more than $2 trillion spent in Afghanistan, Costs that researchers at Brown University estimated would be over $300 million a day for 20 years in Afghanistan, for two decades. Yes, the American people should hear this, $300 million a day for two decades. You take the number of $1 trillion, as many say, that's still $150 million a day for two decades. What have we lost as a consequence in terms of opportunities? I refuse to continue the war that was no longer in the service of the vital national interest of our people. I don't think enough people understand how much we have asked of the 1% of this country who put that uniform on, willing to put their lives on the line in defense of our nation. Maybe it's because my deceased son, Bo, served in Iraq for a full year. Before that, Well, and you could really see and I I have to give Biden credit and a genuine f- sentiment and, and feeling about this war. Absolutely. I think you're, you're quite right that that over the last uh, few years, Biden has uh, beca- start, started to realize that the cost of past wars uh, of, of U.S. wars in the Middle East, and particularly, of course, uh, the one in Iraq, uh, were, were much greater, much worse than uh, was, was ever discussed at the time. And, and of course, politically, this country has moved tremendously over the past decade away from acceptance of the wars of the past. Um, and, and I think Biden has come to a fairly clear realization of that political change as well. So I think we see a combination here of both his own a learning um, and becoming more sensitive to uh, the, the costs and partly, of course, the personal cost of his own son being exposed to burn pits. And, and one hopes that he will be uh, because of that more, greater sensitivity, he will begin uh, to lean on the military in terms of its fundamental character of not giving a damn about the, the, the people who fight their wars and exposing them unnecessarily uh, to such uh, dangers to their health uh, as should be uh, simply ruled out uh, by any humane humanitarian institution of any kind. They've gotten away with murder of their own troops in one war after another, and it's time to really call a halt to it. And one would hope that Biden will, in fact, take a firm position on this. You wrote about how the Pentagon had worked to sabotage the Trump administration or Trump himself, his efforts to negotiate with the Taliban and establish his own withdrawal. Do you think, without their interference, that any of this could have looked differently? Um, yes, I do. I think that there is a bigger story here, which is still to be told, about how the military, in fact, um, s- slow rolled, if you will, their uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. Of course, they they had hoped uh, that they could uh, avoid the drawdown of troops under Trump. But he did insist on drawing down troops much more than they wanted from Afghanistan. But what they did do, apparently, is that they slow rolled the withdrawal of uh, of uh, military equipment from the Bagram Air Base, particularly. Um, and uh, they left a great deal 
of uh, equipment to be withdrawn in a very short time after Biden told them in April that he refused to keep um, to keep a 3,500 to 4,000 troop level indefinitely in uh, in Afghanistan. And so um, I, I think there is a basis here, and, and I'm working now on another story uh, to to try to to put piece together the entire uh, history of this slow rolling and and what its implications were. But I think there's a case to be made. There there will be a case to be made that that part of the reason that uh, that the Biden administration was caught uh, so shorthanded in in trying to uh, m make arrangements for people to get out uh, that were affiliated with the U.S. Uh, was that the uh, Pentagon took so long to actually withdraw most of the uh, equipment that needed to be withdrawn from from Afghanistan. And although we've seen the official withdrawal, a de declaration of the end of the war in Afghanistan due to the fact that soldiers may not be on the ground the way they have been in the past, we've already also seen that the U.S. will continue to bomb Afghanistan. And the pretext they're using for that is the existence of the group ISIS-K or isis Khorasan, which we mentioned earlier in this interview. Can you give viewers any understanding of where this group actually came from? Yes, um, but, but first of all, let me just comment specifically on the, uh, the future of U.S. bombing in Afghanistan. I would guess that um, the, that is not going to continue, that it was tied to this one incident, um, that, that um, I think that Biden is not going to allow them to continue bombing at will. Um, and, and I don't think that there's going to be an excuse uh, with regard to uh, claims of terrorist threats from, um, uh, you know, Islamic State uh, uh, Khorasan. Um, so so I, I think that that we are going to see the, the true end of the war, the U.S. war in Afghanistan uh, for the foreseeable future. And, and the, the nature of this organization is that it was formed uh, out of uh, an Al Qaeda, um, an Al Qaeda offshoot, um, the Al Qaeda group that went into Syria, um, you know, the, the Al Qaeda franchise that went into Syria, uh, had a uh, a subgroup that was much more um, jihadist, radically jihadist, and uh, when um, you know they they were the ones who formed the uh, the the ISIS uh, state um, along with uh, people who were still in Iraq um, and and so it was it was people who had been uh, in the fight against um, the United States in Iraq uh, the, the the people who were in actually in a US military uh, camp uh, with thousands and thousands of prisoners, that included the people who who uh, essentially planned the uh, the future that they were going to become an Islamic state while they were still in U.S. military camps in Iraq. That's but Camp Bukha, correct? It only took shape. It only took shape uh, sometime later uh, in 2014, 2015. That's Camp Bukha, correct? That's right. Exactly, Camp Bukha. Yes. Well, finally, Gareth, do you have any sort of optimism looking forward at Biden foreign policy overall? Does this truly signal a break with the Pentagon or is this something about more of a shift to other frontiers, maybe a focus on China, for example? Oh, I think it's the latter, definitely. I, I'm not at all confident. In fact, I am confident that Biden is not going to stand up to the Pentagon with regard to its overall orientation toward confrontation with China. In fact, it's clear that he's bought into that overall policy, uh, that, that overall stance and, uh, and strategy on the part of the Pentagon, which, of course, is the primary moneymaker for the Pentagon. That's the fundamental basis for their 
uh, for their annual budget. So so there's no real possibility that they're going to back away from that. They'll they'll put up a huge fight if they're uh, if they're confronted with an argument against it. Um, so I think that we are faced with uh, you know a fundamental uh, challenge here, a fundamental threat. Let me put it that way: that Biden is going to continue uh, to to peddle the Pentagon line on China, um, and that we will come closer and closer to you know a very dangerous point of confrontation, um, um, absent some surprise uh, in the meantime. Well, I'll look forward to your reporting on China going forward, because I know you've done a really great job at dissecting some of the lies coming out of the intelligence community, as they call it, regarding Beijing and also your upcoming piece you say you're working on about the drawdown in Afghanistan. Always looking forward to your pieces at the Gray Zone, Gareth, and always learn so much from talking to you. Well, thank you so much, Anya. Always glad to be on your show.